She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Hi, welcome to Live, Love, Thrive Women's Empowerment Hour, brought to you by 360karma.com. As you know, we're all about empowering women, and every week we feature the most incredible ladies, and today is no different. Today we're going to have on writer and producer Hope Juber. Her dad was the creator of Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, two of my favorites, I'm sure two of your favorites, and uh, she is a trailblazing woman herself. Can't wait to talk to her. Please give a warm welcome to Hope Juber. Hi, Hope. How Hello. are you? I'm great. How are you, Catherine? Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so happy to have you on today. I'm thrilled to uh, be here. I know. I know we had lunch a couple of weeks ago, and uh, all of your stories were so fantastic. I couldn't wait to have you on and share them with everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, so starting off, first of all, uh, it must have been really such an incredible experience being born here in L.A., and having your father create these like iconic shows. I mean, literally Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch were for sure two of my favorite shows and I think most people from our generation. Well, yeah. uh, they at least knew what they were, yeah. even if they didn't love them. Yeah. Some of you know, Gilligan. Think almost everybody loved them. Yeah. Well, Gilligan had its uh, people who either loved it or hated the critics specifically hated Gilligan's Island. Really? It got the worst reviews of <gasps> any show up to that point in television You're history. Kidding. Oh my god, I loved it. I loved it. It says just, a lot about me. <laughs> I think it says a lot about critics. People are still know, loving it today. Right. It says a lot about critics. Like I, I never agree with them, so nothing's new. You know? <laughs> they they pan a movie and I'll walk out and go, Oh my god, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We were just glad that the people actually saw what dad meant with yes. that show and, and continues it continues yeah. in its popularity. It's very good. Now the Brady Bunch, did that reflect your family in any way or it did in the the sensibility of it. It didn't in the origination of it. The, right. the the way that the Brady Bunch came to be was after Dad had done Gilligan, he was reading the paper and he saw an article in the Times that said that for the first time that families were being, uh, the, the, the merged families were overtaking the singular nuclear family. Because so many people were getting divorced? Exactly. Oh, exactly. So it was a whole and shift in our culture. Statistically, it was the oh. first time that that had become more prominent than the actual, like, mom, dad, two kids, together family. And at and that time, there was no other show right. that had two couples that had been divorced or and somebody brought their died kids and, yeah. together. Right. And remarried. And Dad saw that article in the Times and saw, thought to himself, every writer in Los Angeles is going to see this and going to write that show, so I better do it first. Yeah. So he ran in the other room and he did a treatment, ran to the Writers Guild that very morning, registered it, and thought, okay, well, I'm the first person who has it. And he went to the studios and everybody rejected it. Oh, my gosh. Even after his success? Even after his success. Wow. And then Yours, Mine, and Ours came oh, yeah, out. Yeah, I remember and, that yeah. movie. Yeah. And it became a big hit. And when that happened, all the studios that he'd gone to called him up and said, remember that show that you brought oh in about the gosh. two families? We'd like to take another look at it. Oh, my god! And that's how it actually came to be because yeah. of because um, that little article in the Times. Yeah. It's so interesting. Back in old Hollywood, there was, I think, less competition, right? I mean... It feels like it's more competitive today than it was. Well, so there's speaking certainly of old Hollywood, new Hollywood. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right, and yeah. I think that because it was still the birth of that generation of television right, watchers, and right. Dad had come from radio. He'd done sit, like uh, the equivalent of situation comedy on radio, oh. and then he he actually wanted to be a doctor. Oh my gosh. When he was when he was a young man, he wanted to be a doctor and came out to California to do pre med. And his brother was working for Bob Hope. And oh. so every once in a while, Dad would sell a, sh a joke to Bob Hope. And then when war broke out and Bob Hope needed USO writers, he plucked Dad to be one of his writers. And that kind of st just oh, kept him on that trajectory. So Sherwood Schwartz, your yeah. dad, <laughs> first was writing jokes for Bob Hope before yes. he actually wrote these sitcoms. Yes, yes. Oh. And he started with Ozzie and Harriet on radio. Oh. Before it was a sitcom on TV, it was on radio. Was Gilligan's Island like the first sitcom or one of the first sitcoms, right? 
Not, not really, because there was like what there was, was the first ones. I don't remember. That was uh, I, I, it would I have been before my time. It was or before, our time, yeah. before my time too. Okay. The first one that Dad worked on on TV was, I believe, a show called "I Married Joan," which was oh, with Joan okay. Davis, right. and it was a similar kind of show to "I Love Lucy," oh. where the woman was kind of wacky and and the more and the husband on that show on mm -hmm. "I Married Joan." was Jim Backus, who ended up playing Mr. Howell on Gilligan's Island. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So they had a long-standing relationship as, as when they worked together. Television's changed so much over the years. Like, you know, I'll look back at a show that I loved at that time, and then I'll go, I loved that show at that time. You know, do you ever do that? You go back and you go, oh, you know, um, because it's changed so much over the years, right? Over the decades, mm -hmm. it grows and changes. Like, Will and Grace is definitely different than the Brady Bunch. Or, you know, like, it, it just evolves over time. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. But you're a writer, mm -hmm. and you, uh, uh, and an actress. So you actually started off as an actress and uh, had some reoccurring appearances on the Brady Bunch. On the Brady, yeah, I was Greg's, Greg's girlfriend. girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> And I know we actually have some cute pictures from that, uh, including the one that most people remember, which is when the frog was on your head. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm well, still washing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> you tell people that. So, so I don't even remember the premise of that. What, how did that happen? Oh, it was exact words that they had. Um, they had made Greg lived by his exact words because he said th those weren't my exact words. So when he had promised to take the kids to the frog jumping contest, oh. he couldn't go out on his date with Rachel, which was me. Yeah. And so he he went to the frog jumping contest and then afterwards took me to a movie <laughs> and the frogs were still in the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's that cute. It was an That's interesting cute. scene to film. With the, there oh. was like a, a whole thing. I don't thing. know how you did it. I would have been <sighs> creeped out. <laughs> it was kind of creepy, and I yeah. knew it was coming. So, yeah. But to do the whole scene, knowing that the frog was going to land on my head yeah. any moment, but I could not let that that show because because obviously I was in the middle of the scene but there was a, a landing thing that they built over the car yeah. and there was a guy on the landing with this bag of frogs yeah and he just was dropping them on my head oh and my <laughs> god so um how was Greg like did you actually have a real-life crush on him I didn't really no I, no just not friendly. so much we, we're still yeah. good friends we're oh, I'm cool. I still keep in touch with with Barry and with Maureen the mm -hmm. one who played Marsha. Oh, yeah. She and I are, are still very good friends. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. And what about any of the Gilligan's Island people? Or? I'm still friends with Dawn. Uh -huh. um, there are not very many of them left. Yeah, Dawn and Tina. And Tina was, was a little bit more removed from, yeah. than the other castaways. That show for me was particularly fun because I was I was very young. Yeah. And my school was right down the street from the set. And so after school, I'd always walk down this, the street and go to the set and hang out with the castaways. And it was like my back you know my backyard playground I, yeah. I loved it and I loved them they were all just amazing just uh, not only for actors playing their parts because I don't think you could do a better casting yeah than oh, the, the casting of Gilligan's Island but just as people they just became such a close family it was really oh, cool it was great yeah you hear that a lot of, on, especially on sitcoms that run for many years mm -hmm. yeah it's so interesting so that that these ones are coming back like Will and Grace and last night I saw Roseanne mm -hmm. and you know it's interesting they're coming back after all these years yes um, so uh, you are a prolific writer yourself and uh, took in your father's footsteps and, and wrote um, a musical called the Brady the Brady a musical. very Brady musical a very Brady musical yes, which won and some awards right yes yes yeah. we, we swept the Valley League Awards yeah. and, uh, and hopefully we'll get to do that again yes um, I wrote a play that I'm ex especially proud of mm -hmm. because it, it combined things that that I love I like to combine different elements and this play it's called without Annette mm -hmm. Annette the girl's name but also without Annette because oh, right. uh, yeah, uh, because it is a scripted comedy set in an improvisation workshop, oh. and there's a teacher and all the students who've come to study improv, and they all have their own you know trajectories and characters, and they get involved and and it's got a plot and everything. But whenever they come to a place in the show where the class is going to do a scene or going to do a game, it's really improvised. So. Oh, wow. 
Wow. It's an unusual form. So, so every time it's different. It's different. I love With little that. pockets of improv. And there's kind of roadmaps on how to get back into it. And people were coming to the show three and four times to say which parts were really improvised and which parts weren't. And, and yeah. it was always a surprise. And the actors loved it because it was fresh every night. I love that. And um, will you be doing that again? Or? I would love to do that one again. We've already done it twice. And we just got published in New York. So oh, hopefully a lot of people will be doing it. Yeah. And one thing I found really interesting, because I was, I was kind of curious about actors who had not done or had experience in improv, mm -hmm. if they would be able to do the show. And when we did it the second time, there were three actors who had never had experience with improv. And by the end of the run, they were, they were improvisers. Oh it, was, it actually taught them how to do it. And so I, th I think it would be a really interesting play for theater companies. Yeah, so that they could hone that skill. Yes. That's very cool. Yes, and for improvisers. I've never anything like that. It's Thank so you. ingenious. Thank you. Yeah. And it's also for improvisers who want to show off their acting chops. Right. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, you also write music. Yes. And you uh, had a band called The Housewives, which is now you have one called The Nasty Housewives, That's which right. I love. <laughs> <laughs> and you say it's for the re-sisters. Yes, <laughs> cute, yes, cute. yes. And tell me about some of that music, because you, you all are, uh, can we come see, hear you play? Or are you well, you can now, or? see uh, the videos on, oh, on the website. If, you, if anybody wants to check it out, they can go to thenastyhousewives.com. Uh -huh. But you have to make sure to put the the in there, or you okay. just get porn. So, the, oh, <laughs> thenastyhousewives.com. Yes. And uh, we can see you all perform. Right. And the music is things like, I know you named one of them Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted. Yeah. And, uh, um, there, yeah, it's, it's, it's all basically protest yeah. songs. Because you felt like there wasn't a niche mm -hmm. for that, right? That, 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 there, that kind of music wasn't really out there, so you saw an opportunity to... Yes. Well, I had had The Housewives, which was a comedy rock and roll band, which combined, like, we called it domestic rock and roll because it was it was um, songs about things that people didn't really write songs about before. Right. And we got very popular in the 80s through the 90s on lots of television shows. We did all, Oprah and all the morning shows. Really? And, and then when I stopped performing, I really hadn't wanted to, to be involved in performing in a band anymore until the election. Yeah. And right before the election, I was at the gym, and I was sitting next to a woman, and she was uh, shaking her head in dismay as she was watching uh, Trump on one of the monitors. And I wasn't sure if she was ill or upset or what. So I said, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm not. I, I can't stand him. And I said, oh, I'm there too. I, I can't either. So we started talking, and she said she was a songwriter. And I asked her if she had written anything I might have heard of. And she said, you know, the song Lay Down Sally. And I said, oh yeah. Oh, my God, we you love mean, Lay Down Sally. Clapton? And she yeah. Said, yeah, I was in Clapton's band. So she happened to be a big fan of my husband. He's a guitar player. Yeah. And so... For, uh He's been a guitar player for Paul McCartney. Right. He yeah. was in Wings, yes. Yeah. And so she was a, a fan of his, and she came over one day, and we were discussing the lack of protest songs. And we started to write these songs, and they really wrote themselves. Every time yeah. I turned on the TV, whether it was Dress Like a Woman or Overrated or Mar-a-Lago or Bowling Green Massacre, it's like every time I turned on the TV, it was another song title. Right. So we wrote an album's worth of songs, and we did videos for all of them. Oh, my God. And they're all up on our website. I love that. And we brought Roberta Freeman. Now, that Marcy, Marcella Detroit, is the woman I was talking about. She's an extraordinary writer and singer and, and performer. And then we wanted one other woman, and we brought Roberta Freeman in, who's a great backup singer. And so uh, that became The Nasty Housewives. I love it. Yeah, I love it. We And we need that kind of music right now. And, yes. Uh, it, everything you do is always very timely. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so... Um, you had the most interesting story about how you met your husband that we were just talking about, Lawrence, Lawrence. Uh, who, like you said, was a uh, played guitar for Paul McCartney and Wings. And you were a huge Beatles fan, as yes. many of us are. As, yeah. well, as yeah. most people should be, I think. As most people should be. <laughs> and you told me the most outrageous story about how you and him met. Yes, I sometimes looking back on it, it is, it is it, astounding to me that it is really a, the, the story. The story you tell me is absolutely surreal. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, you know, so I know it started when uh, John Lennon had uh, been killed. Yes. And 
you were devastated by this. Yes, as as most of as the world most of America was, yes. and yeah. the world. Yeah, um, but I wasn't really coming out of it very well. Right, and I was very very depressed, and my parents noticed that I I just wasn't doing well. I yeah. didn't want to eat. I didn't want to get up. I I just was so devastated that somebody would assassinate an artist like that. Right. And, and one day my mother called me up and she said, well, I have an idea. Why don't you go get your hair done? That'll make you feel better. <laughs> and I just... I, <laughs> you were like, what? Oh, uh, yeah. I was like, yeah. Mom, you know. But, but yeah. I knew she, she meant was well. Yeah, yeah, she was trying. She, yeah, yeah, she wanted me to feel better. So I said, okay, I'll get my hair done. Yeah. So she made an appointment and I went to Beverly Hills where her hairdresser guy was. And, and he started doing my hair and he said, you look really sad. What's going on with you? And I said, well, I... I've been really depressed ever since John Lennon was killed. And he said, well, you know what? I have one more client, so go downstairs and, and walk around the block once. When you're done, I'll be done. And then we'll go have a cup of coffee and we can talk. And I thought, okay, fine, I'll do that. So I went downstairs and I started to walk around the block. And I really wasn't looking where I was going. I just had my head down and I ended up like walking straight into somebody. I was like, bam. And I, I, I was on a pair of boots. And I, I looked up. And I was standing on Ringo Starr. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. I know. Yeah. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe it myself. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I'm just so sorry I stepped on you. And, and I turned to leave and I said, and I'm, I'm so sorry about John. And he, he called to me and he said, hold on a minute. Can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And I turned around, came back, and he was there with his wife, Barbara. And, and um, he said, he said, can I talk to you about my relationship with, with John? I want to I wanna just talk to you. And I said, sure. I was, I was surprised. I, I mean, I didn't know him. And yeah. So he and started. he needed to talk too, it sounds like. I yeah. guess so. And, and, I, or maybe he just saw it in my face. Yeah, he just it must knew. Have been some sort of um, uh, connection between you two that is intangible, it, it, as often it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really surprised me that yeah. he, he wanted to. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I'd like to to just talk to you for a minute and I said okay so he's telling me about his relationship with John and about this new album that he was working on and for him like work was the most important thing to, the focus on work can bring you in through any kind of depression or any kind of uh, sadness the thing that will help you through your troubles is really to focus in on the work it gives you a real a real like uh, reason so like yeah. here's Ringo giving you a pep talk yes yeah. yes <laughs> it's and, it's surreal like I said I know and I was I was shocked yeah. and I, I thanked him so much and I, I turned, I went home and I was thinking about it a lot and the next, in a couple of days I got a phone call from my dad and he said, I'm working on this new show and I'd like you to come down and be a writer on the show and he'd asked me to do that on a few of his other shows but I always was like, no, I'm not going to write with my dad, I'm going to make it on my own and yeah. I changed my name and everything and, and he asked me if I would come down and be a writer on the show and I was going to say no, and then I thought, maybe that whole Ringo encounter, maybe that was telling me I just need to work. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I started uh, working at Paramount on um, a Bra The Brady Brides, which was a spinoff from The Brady Bunch. Mm -hmm. And I uh, became a story editor pretty quickly on the show. And our soundstage was right next to the Mork and Mindy soundstage. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in this really kind of fun relationship with uh, Robin Williams. Right. Oh, my God. What a magnificent man. Oh, my. Yeah. Brilliant. He was he, yeah. absolutely brilliant and, and really sensitive and sweet. And, and he was going to New York to do The World According to Garp. Oh, right. And he said, um, if you get a chance, I'd like you to come join me in New York. And I said, okay, well, we're in the middle of filming, so I don't know that I, I could do it. But if we go on hiatus, I'll, I'll give you a call. And he said, okay, call my house. So... I called his house when we went on hiatus, and, and uh, this woman answered the phone, and she had a very thick ac accent, and her name was Charlie, and she said, oh, yeah, he said you'd be calling, and here's where he's staying. So I went to New York, and he was going to do an interview one night, and he said, I'm going to send you to uh, a club to wait for me, and I said, okay. So I went to this club, and I walked in, and I heard that the guitarist for McCartney was there. Now, I didn't know the members of Wings at all, but I thought that was cool, you know? Yeah. And so I'm talking to this woman who at the bar. We're sitting there at the bar, and, and she was a singer, and she said, oh, I'm working with these musicians, and here they come. Do you want to meet them? I said, sure. So these three guys walk over, and Lawrence is in the middle, and it was one of those movie moments or sitcom moments where everything gets all hazy yeah. and weird yeah. and it's just like him and me and, and I just forgot 
all about why I was in New York, forgot all about Robin, <laughs> and I ended up walking out with Lawrence. And we went for something to eat, and then we went back to his apartment, and I walked in, and there was a gigantic Wings poster, and I said, that's you. Uh -huh. And he said, yeah, I was in that band. So it had gone from John Lennon's death to Ringo to Paul's guitar player, <laughs> and, there, and that night, Lawrence started talking about marriage. Oh he God. knew immediately when he saw me that we were going to get married. The night he met you. Mm -hmm. Oh and my God, was, that is wild. It was crazy. Yeah. And, and what's crazier is... I think was, if somebody started talking about marriage the night I met them, I would have run so fast. <laughs> but <laughs> here you are, 25 years later, or how long? 36. 36? Yeah. Okay. And he when you said, know, you know. <laughs> yes. And he said that... Um, that his girlfriend, his old girlfriend, was staying at uh, Eric Idle's house in in L.A. doing a uh, doing an album, and I said, "No, she's not." And I, she said, "What do you mean she's not?" I said, "Her name's Charlie, right?" And he said, "Yeah." And I said, "She's at Robin's house." So I had spoken to his old girlfriend oh. just hours before I got on the plane. Oh my god! And then Lawrence had just finished working on Ringo's album. That album that he Ringo was talking right, about, right. Lawrence played lead guitar. So it kind of went full circle. It was all these connections. I felt like it was so Beatle connected, and I was just kind of picked up and put into New York to meet to meet Lawrence. Unbelievable. And that's how we met. It's crazy, but. And I know we don't have much a lot of time left, but one of the stories I loved that you told me is that eventually it was a day coming that you were going to go over to the studio and meet. Oh, George um, Harrison? George Harrison. Yes. But you were pregnant. Yes. So, um, the, yeah, yeah, you go ahead and tell the story. The <laughs> yeah, I was, I was pregnant, but we would made arrangements that the next day I was going to go meet George Harrison because I'd never met him. And so uh, that night I went into labor. And instead of, here comes the son, it was, here comes the daughter. So, <laughs> so went to the hospital, gave birth, and Lawrence went off to work with George. And that morning I got a call from George Harrison saying, if, you, if you're able to, bring the baby. I'd love to meet you, meet the baby. So Ilse was two days old, and we brought her to the recording studio. First I have place, bumps over the story. Oh, yeah. It was the first place she'd ever gone. Yeah, wow. And George came and took her out of the carrier and started waltzing with her in this big cavernous studio, and he's waltzing, and he's talking to her in Sanskrit, and, and we just stood back, and it was like magic. And he came over, and he said something to her in Sanskrit, and he touched her here, and he handed her to me, and I said, what did you say? And he said, well, I was just enjoying this new life and feeling her energy and at the end I decided that I would really like to give her the gift of music and so I did. Oh my gosh. And now she's writing hit songs. She is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now your daughter's name? Ilse. Ilse. I-L-S-E-Y. And, I, -L -S -E -Y, and yeah. I know you mentioned a couple of the songs that she... Oh she wrote, she had one on the Beyonce album, oh she has gosh. one on Kelly Clarkson's new album, oh she wrote Kelly. Mercy for Shawn Mendes. She's, uh, yeah, she's... Yeah, she's uh, rocking and rolling, so she, to speak. She is, yeah. yeah. And my yeah. other daughter's name is Nico, I don't want to give her a short yes, trip. absolutely. <laughs> what does Nico do? Nico works for Adobe, she's an advertising, uh, she's like an executive over there, she, yeah. she markets their new products. Well I knew you'd have two smart trailblazing daughters. And she, yeah. she has two kids and she runs a non-profit organization called oh. Thrive Survive for Young Cancer Survivors. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Two amazing women. Huh? I, yeah, yeah, I'm very proud of them. They have it's just... a good time to be a woman, and it's a good time to be a young woman because th yes. just so many doors and ceilings are flying off the wall now, you know, opening up for uh, women to be able to do anything and everything. It's really you true. You know, we're still 4% of the CEOs. We're still only 15% of the government, but that's all changing. Look at what these wonderful kids in Parkland have oh, done this week, raised an entire so much respect for movement those around this country. Yes. Those kids in Parkland. I Bravo think to them. Bravo. And I think yeah. it's that kind of uh, uh, enthusiasm, not even enthusiasm, passion. Passion. Passion and personal devotion to their mm -hmm. cause. That's, I mean, uh, that was. Unstoppable. Yeah. That's what it took with the Vietnamese. The, yes. Yeah, that was the Vietnam. 
protests. Mm -hmm. It was, I remember, I, I led walkouts for that, and I was, mm -hmm. I was 17, 16 years yeah. old, and that it didn't affect me personally, but when we got the passion for, we have to do this, right. those passionate kids become unstoppable, right. and that's what it takes. So right. I'm, I'm really proud of them, and I, I have a lot of faith in those kids. And I am proud of you and oh. the passion you have with your uh, focusing on the re-sisters <laughs> with the Nasty Housewives. Thank you. And all the cool stuff that you're doing. I know you have a move, great a women's empowerment movie script in the work. So yes. hope you're so talented. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, it's so important that people use their gifts to give back. That's yes. why we're here. Yes. So keep it up, sister. I keep certainly will. Keep it up, please, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I don't intend to stop. <laughs> I love it. Well, we will be back next week with more great women on uh, on the show. Of course, uh, you know, check us out at 360karma.com because we are all about empowering women and empowering you. So follow us on our Facebook and, uh, of course, Twitter and Instagram at My360Karma. Take care. Make it a great day. Hugs and happiness. <laughs>